Hi Aditya. So the first question I want to start is how did you get into pharma equity research and then pharma fund management? So how how did it happen? That works as an introduction for the audience. Sure. Um, so there's a lot of uh, serendipity and a lot of uh, coincidences with my career of pharma. Actually, my grandfather was a police inspector. Okay. And you know, as a police inspector, he had a lot of friends who used to invest in primary IPOs. So nothing secondary, no secondary market dealings, only apply for IPOs. Interesting. Um, and through his uh, investing journey of a few years, uh, he ended up investing in something like 20 stocks, you know, in IPOs. And by the time, I think year 2004, when I was done with my BCom, I was almost done with my CFA and I was about to go for my MBA. My grandfather just called me one day and he said, uh, look, I know you're studying all of this and I have no understanding of all of this. This is what I've done in the past. So he had this 20 share certificates, you know, the hard copy certificates. 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 <laughs> uh, they were not dematerialized even back then. So uh, he said, look, uh, this is what I've done. And I don't know what it's worth today. You just have a look. So when I look up, looked at those companies, 18 of those 20 stocks had stopped trading. They were not, all right. The companies had vanished basically. And uh, only two stocks were trading. Uh, so Ranbaxy and Divi's Labs. Pharma. Both pharma. So, okay. And because I was studying CFA and I had done mm-hmm. my BCom, I knew that if I had to understand what to do with these shares, I had to first value those shares. If I had to value those shares, I had to go back to, uh, I had to go back to uh, basically reading the annual reports of those companies. So, uh, so I started reading annual reports of Ranbaxy. Started reading annual reports okay. of Divi's. Uh, Ten years each, I read their annual reports. And uh, once I read them, you know, I did my own analysis, whatever I could do. And I decided, okay, we, we can stick with these companies for long. Uh, then, you know, after this, uh, when I joined my B school, at my B school during summer internship, the first company on campus was Glenmark Pharmaceuticals. Pharma again. Uh, again. So, uh, Glenmark basically came and said, uh, you know, we want to interview a few candidates for summer internship. And obviously, they interviewed a few candidates, but you wouldn't expect any of these candidates to have any knowledge of the pharma sector because, because the sector becomes very specific and unique. It is in its, unique. In its as, a, as a consumer, you don't really experience the sector's internal workings. Yes. You are just buying the product from the pharmacy. Right. You don't know what the internal workings of the sector are. But because I had done my work on Ranbaxy and right. Davies, I was able to talk to them in their language about the sector. So you got Glenmark. Right. So Glenmark gave me my summer internship. Okay. Uh, and they liked my work in the summer internship. They gave me a private placement offer. And I ended up joining Glenmark from campus for a And that was in which role you yeah. joined in? So my job in Glenmark was that of a treasurer. Okay. To basically manage cash flow of the company. So manage the working capital cycle, do the due diligence for acquisition targets, budgeting exercises for R&D, IT. Okay, so budgeting and uh, budgeting for the organizations, yes. uh, M&A acquisitions, etc. Yes. Also, as well as the working capital, so understanding the entire operating aspect okay. of the business as well. More so importantly, right the center of the cash flows and, and exactly, yeah, that's what I was to say. So more importantly, I used to know and understand where the cash is coming from, where okay. is it going, so I could see the trail of the digital trail of cash flow everywhere. So right in the middle of the action. The activity, yeah, yes, the action. <laughs> yes, that that is true. And after my journey with Glenmark, I ended up joining a financial services company, a US big four uh, financial services company uh, in the role of equity research. Uh, and that equity research was pharma specific? Pharma industry specific, specific. Industry specific. Perfect. Because I had worked in the pharma company, I knew right. how the pharma universe works. So that was a natural sort of transition from that right. role of a treasurer to the pharma company. And then equity research led you to fund management? Yes, obviously. So, uh, you know, once you, you as an equity research analyst, you are servicing fund managers, buy sell analysts, Correct. telling them what to buy, what to sell, what not to buy and all that. And uh, if they like your work and if they want you to come and work with them, they offer you a buy side role, which is what happened to me. So yeah, it's, it's natural transition and, and generally when you're looking at fund management, of course, it's difficult to suddenly, you know, be given that kind of AUM. So it's normally through equity research, building yes. the depth about the industry and yes. then you end up into fund management. Obviously, yes, yes. So you have to build up the depth, you have to build up the understanding of multiple industries sometimes, sometimes a specific industry. And uh, then you get into the fund management role, which is where you're actually given money to manage. So it's a very long journey to get here. But if you have the passion for equities, you have the passion for understanding different business models, you know, it's a very exciting role in that fashion. So you'll have to sort of understand whether you are built for this or not, or this is built for you or not. You have to be selective. Very interesting. So IPOs led you to to fund management and farm. Absolutely. Wonderful. Wonderful. So moving forward, how important is industry research while performing security selection? So I think it's incredibly important. 
I think in majority of the cases, people tend to get too engaged with the fundamentals of the company and forget to understand the ecosystem in which the company is operating. See, the fundamentals are correlated with the ecosystem. Unless you understand the ecosystem in which the company operates, how do you understand whether the fundamental performance of the company will sustain or improve or deteriorate? So you need to understand the ecosystem first. So, for example, if you are going to do research on, let's say, Eris Life Sciences, which sells drugs in India, then you have to understand the Indian pharma market. You have to understand the Indian drugs ecosystem. How does the drug get prescribed? Who prescribes the drug? Why does a doctor prescribe that drug? Who buys the drug? How much price is able to pay? Who are the competitors of Eris Life Science? What is the subcategories of drugs that Eris sells? What are the other companies who are selling those same subcategories? How is Eris performing against those companies? Why is Eris performing better or worse? Only when you can answer many of these questions and you can understand this industry structure. Do you go to a company level and then seek more understanding of the financials of the company, the potential of the company? So it's like uh, betting on a horse without knowing the track, right? You need to know the track that the horse is going to cover. So the horse needs to be powerful and strong, yes. But if the track is not suitable for the horse, you cannot run a 100 meter horse on a 1 kilometer track. You cannot run a 1 kilometer horse on a 100 meter race. They will, right. not, they will not suit. So you need to find the track and the horse. The right combination is a winning combination. So both bottom up and top down are very, very important. And to understand the industry sector, you have to follow the industry very, very importantly. You have to understand. So that brings me to the next question. How do you do that industry analysis? So do you do a top down approach? Do you follow a bottom up approach? Understanding the technicalities of the industry. So how do you delve in depth in terms of an industry? So there are multiple moving parts to it. One is obviously the regulatory framework. The other is how how the ecosystem is, what is the potential disruption. See, we live in a time when digital technologies are disrupting majority of the industries. And then you have to understand the cash flow. You have to follow the cash. In any industry, you have to understand who is paying the money. More often than not, it's people like us mm -hmm. uh, who pay uh, any industry. Ultimately, yes. Ultimately. Uh, so you have to start uh, with analyzing the cash flow from there. Okay, so the consumer is paying X person or X channel and is paying because this is what the consumer receives in return. And then where does the movie that where does the money you know follow there and how does it reach the company that you're trying to understand or the industry uh, that you're trying to understand so therefore who are the various partners the various moving variables with these partners so how do we do it so say for example if i'm looking at analyzing pharma industry right which is your forte which is your core area right so if i were to understand and learn about pharma industry where would i start so let's say if i were to understand the indian pharma industry in particular who pays the money we we buy drugs because we have a prescription in hand we go and buy drugs, we pay the cash to the pharmacy. Now to understand the cash flow then, I have paid it to the pharmacist, the pharmacist buys the drugs from a wholesaler, so he pays to the wholesaler, the wholesaler buys it from a manufacturer, he pays the manufacturer. So that's one part of the chain. Now on the consumer side, why did I buy this drug? Because I have a prescription which mentions the name of the drug. Now why, who gave me the prescription? The doctor. Now why does the doctor write that prescription? That brand name. So doctor has choices of writing hundreds of brands. Why did he write that brand name? This particular company is liaisoning with the doctor, is promoting his brands to the doctor. So therefore the doctor is writing his medications. So either the doctor believes the quality is the best or the doctor believes the uh, company has certain arrangement with him. The company has educated him well on the quality of the drug. So when you follow the money, the money can leave its own trail, right? In any and in industry. India, doctors recommend brands as compared to the West, the US per se, wherein the generic or the for, the formula is basically yeah. what is recommended. Yeah, so India, most emerging markets are branded generic markets. Okay. So paracetamol in India is not called paracetamol, it is called Calpol, Crocin, Dolo, right. you know, various names. And, and But a paracetamol tablet today in US will be called paracetamol. So the nuances of the industry uh, looking at pharma context in India is going to be different from what exactly. we're looking at in US. Yes, yes. So particularly for pharma industry, each geography has its own set of regulations. It's a highly regulated industry and each market has a different regulation. So it's a very complex industry therefore to understand. But some of the largest pharma markets in the world are India, US, Japan, European. Uh, and then these markets have some similarities and some peculiarities. And uh, that is how you know you, are, you go about decoding any industry. Okay. So how to get that industry expertise? Or should one be very sector agnostic? So I'm not asking from an investor's perspective because of course an investor would like to be more diversified but uh, maybe from, from, from an equity research or an analyst perspective who's making a foray into, into uh, equity research and investment as a full-time profession. Right. So how do you, how do you, sell, uh, you know, get that industry expertise? So see, first of all, mostly if you look at the structure of the investment business, 
So there is a fund manager who is basically an aggregator of expertise. Okay, he is okay. a generalist. He is not a specialist in any one sector. He invests across sectors. So he will right. have many people under him called we call analysts, right? Uh, who are basically expert experts in each sub sector. Right. Right. And these analysts feed the expertise into the fund manager who basically acts as a has multiple sub sectors and each right. sub sector would have multiple companies. So if you go about from the company, you know, you just might do a lot of work and then realize I'm in the wrong sub sector. Right. Or you, you might like the sub sector, but when you go to the industry, you might not like the industry. Right. So so then it is always better to go top down from that. So you figure out the right sector or the sub sector and then, and then you, you choose whichever is the best stock in terms of value terms. or the growth story. Also you study different companies. So you know within a sub sector many companies will adopt different strategies right. to, to achieve the same objective. So you choose the company which strategy you agree with, you know, or the, or, or you like the valuation, or, or you like the management more, right? Sometimes, uh, so I'll give you some examples. For instance, uh, a subsector like the U.S. A generic pharma business, right? Now, a majority of the companies in India today are struggling in their business because the business structure is really poor today. Okay. But somebody, uh, somebody like a, let's say a granules is doing great in that business. Despite okay. being in that business, they're doing great. Uh, Loris is doing well in that business. Correct. Uh, despite being, you know, uh, in in a very poor subsector, they're able to do very well. I made money in Loris Labs. <laughs> so, uh, so that's great. But uh, so the point that I really wanted to focus on here is that sometimes in a tough business, really good people still get going. Okay. And uh, you know, sometimes in a very good subsector, really bad people will not be able to make money. So you figure out the good to great. The good to great. Basically, you try to choose managements that are honest, that are competent, that are transparent. Uh, and, and, and you you then it's very easy for you to understand the strategy of the management because you understand the subsector. So you ask them relevant questions or you know, if it, it's, this is what is happening in your subsector, how does your strategy feed into how the subsector is involved? Okay. And then you see, you agree with the marriage, right? I mean, there can be different strategies to achieve the same goal. You need to agree with the strategy or the uh, way the business is evolving. And if you agree with it, then the valuation is in your favor, then just go for it, right? I mean, uh, that is how basically stock selection. So this is bottom up and that is top down. Mm -hmm. So we have to do both. It's not either or, but yes, one comes before the other in my uh, way. In my process, top down comes before the bottom up. So we follow the top down approach from, from your angle. Okay. So how do you see the pharma industry to be different from other industries? Because as you mentioned, that the technicalities are far too much when you're looking at an industry like pharma. Yeah. So what are the peculiarities or the uniqueness of pharma industry? And how does that uniqueness become a part of the valuation? How does it lead to valuations? Correct. So, uh, so the pharma uh, industry is unique because it's extremely regulated. It's perhaps the most regulated industry in the world. Right. Because what the companies sell here, we consume. It goes into our blood and our stomach, right? Right. So, uh, so it has to be regulated fairly, uh, and regulations across geographies are different. So, the regulations in US is very different from what it is for each European yes. country. It is very different for India, very different for Japan, China. It is different all across. So, uh, so pharma industry because it is heavily regulated, it's a bit technical, uh, but then there is a lot of things which are unique to the industry, and it comes into the valuations. Now, what is unique in pharma industry? Consumption is absolutely non-discretionary. Correct. There is no so the elasticity goes for a toss over there. Exactly. And the bargaining power of consumers is negligible. Zero. Negligible. Negligible. Correct. Zero. Right. So, uh, so if a doctor gives you a prescription, if you want to you stay alive, you consume. Right. You don't care whether a, a strip of protein is 35, 38 or 40. You still buy what the doctor is prescribing because you have to consume to stay alive. Right. Uh, so it's absolutely non-discretionary consumption. Uh, there is absolute zero linkage to macro. Right. Yes. So interest rate, you have, you have never borrowed to buy a drug. Correct. Right? So interest rate sensitivity, sensitivity at the consumer end is so just totally not becomes different from a real estate or an auto industry. Exactly, which are highly sensitive. And even the banking, even a banking, for that matter. Which is why they are called cyclicals. Because Correct. interest rates have cycles. Correct. And because interest rates have cycles, these industries will have cycles. And which is why pharma falls under defensive. It, it has no cycle. It has no sensitivity. Right. Right. Uh, it is not sensitive to disposable income. Uh, simply because, uh, let's say if I have 5,000 rupees of disposable income and I have to buy one strip of protein which is 35 rupees, I'll buy one strip. Tomorrow, if my disposable income goes up to 50,000, I'm not suddenly going to buy 10 strips of protein. I'll still buy one strip of protein. Or it falls to 500, I'm not going to stop buying mm -hmm. protein. I'll still buy that one strip of protein. So it's not sensitive to GDP, not sensitive to disposable income. So it's a very, very unique sector in that way because the consumption is absolutely non-discretionary, non-price elastic. 
very very defensive and in times like these especially when investors are so scared about inflation interest rates recession a sector like this gets a lot of uh, investor favor because right. investors know that the consumption here is not going anywhere yes right so uh, that is why i absolutely uh, believe in working for this sector i have a passion for the sector i feel that the average investor in the average jew in india doesn't appreciate the sector as much as you know foreigners and foreign mm-hmm. institutions i've seen them appreciate the sector as much uh, and the and that will come with time as right. people get more understanding so uh, my next question is that when you're looking at an industry industry as large as pharma could also be very heterogeneous so i've seen a couple of your interviews before and we talk about the sub sectors within that industry so when you're looking at a pharma you've got uh, your drug manufacturing you've got your diagnostic you've got the hospital uh, hospital uh, industry you've got the research industry so when you're looking at these sub sectors it becomes again very very unique within that industry itself yeah. and then within the sub sectors as well you have companies which have a very very different kind of a business model or a positioning in terms of in terms of the market so how do you how do you see that how do you manage that uniqueness and how do you look at the uniqueness from the research point of view okay. because it cannot be a plug and play model there so how do you no. capture the uniqueness into your research and valuation so let's let's take an example let's say that for diagnostics right so so diagnostics as an industry is a very uh, you know mm-hmm. fast growing industry now. yes now but within diagnostics let's take three business models we have dr lal which is a completely b2c sort of a franchise they have their own regional laboratories and collection centers which have the dr lal branding and the dr lal guy will come and take a sample and we mm-hmm. go to dr lal laboratory and they get a dr lal report a right? service element in there a service element in there right. a branding involved in there right? yes. so there's a top of the mind before for dr lal uh, so that's a completely vertically integrated mm-hmm. uh, uh, diagnostic lab right. right so that's one example the other example is i said thyro care now thyro okay. care is only a back end so they do not have front end you will not have a thyro care phlebotomist generally coming and collecting blood sample right. you will have a sunflower diagnostic coming and collecting the blood sample and that sample from sunflower diagnostic will go to thyro care's lab and the report will come to sunflower and the sunflower forward the report to you thyro care playing very uniquely on that operating leverage operating because of the heavy investment the front end equipment yes, right exactly and, and dr lal has made that investment in the front end which right. is why you see dr lal's roe is 22% Okay. And thyro care's ROE used to be forty percent before they were acquired before the COVID right. era. It used to be forty percent. So uh, why forty percent? Because they don't incur the high cost of the front end that Dr. Lal right. incurs. But because Dr. Lal incurs that cost today, Dr. Lal is multiple size to size of thyro care because thyro care does not have the pull for the branding, yes. and Dr. Lal has a pull from the branding, right? Now the third uh, type of companies which are coming to this is Tata like Energy. This is just a right. front end. It's just an app. There is no front end also there, as in there is no right. brick and mortar front end. It's a digital front end. So now you can see why Pharmacy acquired uh, Thyro Care, right? So it was a digital front end acquiring a strong back end, right. and that marriage just strategically makes sense. So when you when you analyze diagnostics, then you need to understand that there are these three different kind of business models happening in diagnostics. There is a strong back end company, there is a integrated back end front end company, and then there is only a strong front end company also. So when you study the diagnostic sector, understand that the patient needs to get a test done. He needs a service. He needs a report, and he needs a quality assurance. So how do you offer all these things to the patient? Three business models working in the same sub sector. Same sub sector. Right. Trying to achieve the same objective of satisfying Correct. the patient. Correct. At a reasonable price point. Right. Right. So then you study each of these companies and understand their philosophies, their strategies, and then you try to see which one you agree with most, or which one in your belief will do best. Now, uh, a Tata Energy will be making losses today. It's burning cash. Right. Because today their customer acquisition cost is very high. Right. Right. I Thyro Care has zero customer acquisition cost because Correct. Thyro Care is not there on the front end. And Pharmacy is doing that for Thyro Care. And Pharmacy today is doing that for the Correct. for Thyro Care. So Pharmacy is burning cash. Correct. But a Thyro Care shareholder doesn't have to burn that cash because Correct. he is not a stakeholder in Pharmacy. Right. Pharmacy owns Thyro Care, not the other way around. Right. Thyro Care doesn't own Pharmacy. Right. Right. Now, the, and a Dr. Lal shareholder is is on both sides of the game. He's mm-hmm. very efficient front back end. and he has a sort of a front end which is asset heavy but is not burning cash because with dr lal has sort of reached a scale where Correct. they don't need to burn cash on the front end the customer acquisition cost is that isn't that high anymore so so they are all three companies are at different stages of evolution but they are in the same subsector so you analyze all these business models you try to understand what is working for the consumer Correct. which is working for the company in terms of cash flows and financials in order to get an understanding of that subsector within the industry within the industry 
and then the multiple subsectors and their linkages together exactly lead you to the industry. So can a Tata One Energy disrupt diagnostics? Will the pharmacy disrupt diagnostics? Right. But because they're lowering prices and getting volumes. Is it is it how diagnostics will play out? So if what if I tell you that seventy percent of diagnostic tests in India are driven by doctor prescriptions? Okay. Now will a doctor prescription drive a Tata One Energy pharmacy uh, test? Maybe no. He will send you to a doctor lal because doctor lal he has been you know doing business with doctor lal for twenty years. Understands the brand, understands the quality. God knows what kind of report will come out of a Tata Energy. I'm just guessing. I don't know. Correct. I'm just guessing. I'm We're not making any comments with respect to any company. Any, exactly. Any credibility so with respect. These to are these are just uh, just you know thoughts. Questions. Uh, correct. Questions and thoughts. So so I'm just saying that you know people today are saying that Tata Energy or pharmacy can disrupt diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I am on the side of the table where I'm saying well will they be able to? They're trying. So why did Tata Energy launch this uh, 100 rupee test thing only in Bangalore? It's Tata, no? They could have launched across India. Correct. Why did they launch only in Bangalore? So it's a pilot. Correct. And yeah. the perception of the consumer and the adaptability probably in Bangalore is higher, and faster, right? And higher population, Correct. startup, Correct. startup ecosystem. And the consumers are getting very educated and they want to compare prices for everything. They Absolutely. feel very intelligent and smart. Smart. When when they are able to save even a ten rupees using a coupon or a voucher. Now, now once you have understood why Tata One Energy has launched it in Bangalore, mm -hmm. my question is: the fact that they only launched it in Bangalore also tells you that, that they are not sure yes. whether it will work. Because if they were sure, they probably would have launched it all over India. Correct. Now, what if I tell you that Tata One Energy's tests, most of these tests on the back end are going to be run by Thyrocare. Tata One Energy okay. doesn't have a lab. Right. Thyrocare has a lab. Now, Tata One Energy might be charging you as a customer hundred rupees, but Thyrocare is going to charge the same one fifty rupees to Tata One Energy to run that test. So, Tata One Energy is therefore going burn to burn cash. Now, how long can they do that? And right. when they stop it, what happens? Right. Right. So, when Ola Uber or something like that stop giving you discounts, did you go back to Kali Pili or did you stop stick with Uber Ola? Right. You've changed the consumer behavior. You've changed altogether. the consumer behavior altogether. So, will Tata One Energy be able to do that? Will they not be? So I'm, I'm just throwing questions, right? So these right. are questions that will come to you in your investment journey in the time when you study sectors, subsectors, and some of these questions will not have answers. You, right. It's an we'll educated guess. With time. Yes, it's an educated guess. Right. So you take an educated guess, you believe, you form a belief, and you follow the belief when you invest. So as an analyst or a researcher or a fund manager, fund manager comes in much later. So as an analyst, how do you select the which as to which industry you want to work in? So see, mostly uh, what I've seen is I've seen very successful people in industries which are not really sunshine industries, and I've seen very very mediocre people in very very sunshine industries. Right. So what is the difference? The industry structure obviously helps you grow to a certain extent. You grow with the industry, but at the same time you need to have a passion for the job. You need to like Correct. what you're doing. Right. So more often than not, it's about figuring out what you want to do or figuring out what you like to do as a job. Right. So you know, people who are in their early stages of the career, like most of your students are, my recommendation to them will be: be open to risk, be open to making mistakes. You are young; you have a lot of working life ahead of you. Don't be afraid of making mistakes. You know, take do a few experiments. So you see the best opportunity or alternative you're getting in the market. Correct. Jump into it. Learn absolutely as yeah. much as you can. Figure out if you're liking it, not liking it. Exactly. If you're not liking it, move. Switch. Move. But if you're liking it, gain depth. Gain depth. Absolutely. So depth and Hard work. There is no alternative, right? I mean, these have to be there. The icing on the cake is if you like what you're doing, right? So, right. so let's say you got into an IT company. You, you have learned uh, about you know coding. You have learned about uh, business analysis and all that, but you don't like doing it, right? So be open to change. It's early part of your career. Be open to change. Change. You know, if you need to study something else, if you need to get some more education, get some more education. Get into a different field. Maybe you like it. Maybe you won't like it there too. Change again. Don't be afraid to make some mistakes. Make some mistakes. But how do you know? When do you know that that pharma chose you? But how do you know for an individual as to you know this is the industry I want to continue working in? See whether you go to the office because your boss is calling you, <laughs> or you go to the office because you want to be there, right? Right. I think that's how you know. See, first a uh, year or so, everybody is excited. There's a lot of learning curve, right? And 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 there's a lot of camaraderie in many cases. The culture, if the culture is good, so you go to office yourself. It's after twelve months or so you start figuring out whether you're going to office because you have to be there or you're going to office because you want to be there, right? So, so there has to be excitement. There has to be new Absolutely. learning. Absolutely. You just cannot be complacent. From yeah. what I've seen and and the way things are changing, like the business models you 
told about be thyrocare getting acquired by pharmacy or when we're looking at a doctor lab versus a tata one ng coming in if you cannot understand the importance even when i was reading about swiggy again you know using mm-hmm. the data analytics to open their own cloud kitchen Correct. based on what is selling more in which area Correct. so maybe tata one ng later on decides to figure out what laboratories to set up because where they have more volume in mm-hmm. what kind of areas awesome. what tests are doing better i mean just just thinking again you know okay. uh, so that that's that's very interesting if if you are getting that depth and if you start knowing much more about your industry and there's just too much happening okay. so at times it gets overwhelming as well it does it does a lot of information flow i mean uh, so you have to pick and choose what you want to do right this or how much you want to read right see uh, people say reading is very important i'm a big endorser of reading but if you are overread if you're not practicing what you're reading or if you're not going in depth reading the superficial information won't help you you forget it the next right day. so my suggestion generally is you know read obviously read a lot but be be specific to on what subjects you are reading so be organized know yes. what you would have to read correct because and what you, you can skip exactly because uh-huh. you cannot read everything i had a you student can't. question this to me and even i have a lot of uh, books on my reading list to right. be read but then i have to take a firm call that this is the area i need to improve upon Absolutely. now and this is the area i can look at it later, later. this is the area i need an absolute expertise in this is the area i just want to improve at the moment and and accordingly get my reading list sorted absolutely. and probably try to get that depth and apply that because i'm actually in the mode of revising a couple of books i was just revising mm-hmm. deep work mm-hmm. and started revising atomic habits because i needed to get back and see whether what i read 2 3 years back and being applying i'm still applying or not makes sense so perfect wonderful wonderful